So hi, I'm Jen van der Hoven, Director of the National Horizon Centre. Thanks for joining us today for In Conversation with the NHC, where we talk to key leaders about current and future challenges and opportunities in the biosciences and healthcare sectors. And today I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Jason Foster, who is the CEO of Ori Biotech. So thanks hi, for joining us today. Hi Jen, thanks for having me. Hey, so do you want to start off by telling me a bit about yourself and sort of your career so far? Sure. Um, I've spent some, most of the last 20 odd years building healthcare and technology businesses. Uh, first in the US, you can tell by my funny accent, I'm an American, um, but I've lived in the UK now for 11 years. Um, I was about halfway through building a CNS focused specialty pharma company um, from 2006 to 2016 uh, that we took from five of us to 1100 of us over 10 years and listed on the LSE in, in 2014. Uh, and that's what brought me to the to the UK. I, I came over in 2010 to help build the European operation for that business and and never left. You guys couldn't get rid of me. So uh, that's how I ended up here uh, and have been really in working in this space for my whole career. After leaving that business, uh, I started advising startups, working with incubators, investing as an angel. Uh, so I have a portfolio of 13 investments myself. Um, I sit on the board of five of them. Uh, including Ori Biotech, which we'll talk about today uh, in more detail. Uh, and I really just tried to be helpful to the ecosystem. We have such a vibrant uh, life sciences ecosystem in London and the UK in general, uh, and just trying to get involved again with early stage startups as an advisor, as an investor, uh, and ultimately now again as an operator. That's fascinating. So I guess perfect timing in terms of the COVID pandemic, which has really kind of shone the light on the UK science um, life sciences sector, um, as you mentioned, and that role of biotech and why it's so important moving forwards. So do you want to tell me a bit about what Ori Biotech's doing in the cell and gene therapy space? Sure. Yeah, of course. I met the founding team of, of Ori in 2018, actually, is uh, the co-founders, Dr. Chris Mason and uh, Dr. Farhan Varech. I'd met at UCL as professors. UCL, you know, has a very extensive history in regenerative medicine. Uh, and we're very close to some of the key research labs in the US uh, and really realized very early on in 2015 uh, that cell and gene therapy had incredible promise. Uh, but the one of the major stumbling blocks, one of the major barriers to getting these incredible therapies to patients uh, was the manufacturing process. The manufacturing can be highly manual, almost kind of like a lab process on steroids where they try and take it to a GMP quality process, but uh, exceedingly manual, often requiring lots of highly skilled people, lots of hands-on uh, labor, and also very large facilities that make the costs almost prohibitive, unfortunately, for some of these therapies. The, of the 20-odd approved therapies that are out there today in cell and gene therapy, the majority of them are, you know, half a million dollars to $2 million a patient. So they, they, they're they kind of withheld to only those patients that have failed many other lines of treatment before because they're so expensive. Uh, so when I met the team in 2018, I was really excited about the opportunity to be able to help millions of patients. So, you know, almost 10 million people a year get diagnosed with cancer. Another 10 million people a year die of cancer every year all over the world. So it's a huge unmet need to be able to treat these patients uh, more efficiently, more effectively. Uh, and often cell and gene therapies represent a potential cure uh, for many patients. So they've been targeted initially mostly in liquid tumors, you know, blood cancers like leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, but unfortunately, as we said, there's only, you know, 10 or 20 percent of the patients out there who could benefit from them that actually get access. So that's really Ori's mission as a company is to enable widespread patient access to this new generation of, of life saving uh, cell and gene therapies. So it was a mission that's easy to get excited about, uh, and I did get excited about it uh, and joined the team full time in 2019, right after we closed our, our seed financing round. And that's really relevant because on the news recently, um, we heard about baby Arthur, who was five months old, who has spinal muscular atrophy, and um, one, he's now one of the first patients in the UK to be treated um, with gene therapies. Um, and, and that one treatment is around 1.8 million. So you mm -hmm. can see what these barriers to adoption of the treatment are. So yeah. along with the kind of the cost of manufacturing, are there any other barriers to the adoption of, of the treatments, um, treatment of patients with cell and gene therapies? Uh, yeah, the barriers are, 
uh, unfortunately, several. Um, I think you know ultimately cost is a significant one. Uh, the cost is a is a byproduct of these kind of inefficient processes. So, if you think about you know a lab process where you have a very highly skilled maybe a PhD immunologist under under a hood, you know micropipetting and using flasks and bags and and moving fluids around trying to create that therapeutic intervention. Um, potentially, you, you have a very logistically challenging process. So in autologous therapy, which means we start with the patient's own cells, their own immune cells, I'm speaking about cell therapy in particular, we'll come back to gene therapy in a minute, it's a little bit different. Uh, but for cell therapy and gene modified cell therapy, in an autologous format, you start with the patient's own cells that are harvested at the hospital. They often go through a very complicated supply chain. Uh, so there's shipped, you know, for right now for some of the initial CAR T therapies, an individual patient cells are shipped from Australia to the Netherlands on a plane uh, to be uh, manufactured and then three or four weeks later frozen and shipped back uh, to the to Australia for, for infusion of the patient. So that kind of really complicated supply chain, very expensive uh, and logistically challenging, increases the vein to vein times. The time you're able to take the patient sample and return the therapeutic back to them uh, is quite long, three or four weeks. And a lot of these patients are refractory. They're, they're very sick patients. They've been through many rounds of chemotherapy often they've been through a transplant perhaps and, and none of that has worked for them so they don't have months months left uh, they only often have weeks so we need to do this very quickly so some of it's a logistical challenge around how the therapies are done uh, some of it is a, a throughput and quality challenge so you have a because you have such manual processes and you're starting with a variable starting material patient cells uh, you often have a variable outcome so you'll have products that are out of spec, they come out you know, outside the bands that the regu regulatory uh, body has set for them, uh, and that creates additional challenges. So the three major, you know, to summarize the three major challenges, it's really cost, uh, it's quality, the quality of the processes and the therapeutic that comes out, uh, and throughput, the ability to treat lots of patients. You know, right now it, is, it has escaped us thus far. We're only able to treat tens or hundreds of patients a year. Uh, and instead of the thousands or tens of thousands that can that could use it, uh, so those are really where the complexity comes in. Uh, and it's great, you know, seeing that some of these products are being used in the NHS in the UK and globally. Uh, on the kind of flip side of the coin uh, to the Zolgensma story that you just told, which is fantastic, um, Bluebird Bio uh, just re withdrew its products in Teglo from Europe. Uh, that costs on the same order, 1.6 million or something like that, uh, because they just couldn't get it reimbursed in the European uh, healthcare setting. They just couldn't find enough payers willing to pay for the product. And because their process, again, is very expensive and difficult, they couldn't make the requisite profit margin to pay back the, the huge sums that they spent on r and So it's something that we definitely need to focus on so that we can make sure that more patients get access to these incredible therapies. And so what do you think is the next stage of the evolution um, of the advanced therapies industries that's needed to you know, break through those barriers and bring down the costs? So I'll, I'll give you a sense of how we're trying to tackle the challenge at Ori, and that might be kind of indicative of, of the trends in the industry as a whole. Um, so as we're looking at it, we, we see the Ori platform really needing to be able to do two things. It needs to be flexible, in the early stages so that academic researchers and research labs can do that process discovery piece that they do and trying to turn uh, the raw materials into a therapeutic and they use very highly skilled individuals and also lab tools like bags or flasks and, and micro pipettes because they need that flexibility they need to be able to add and subtract from the recipe you can think about it like cooking almost it's sort of you add things you subtract things you, you take the temperature you see how it's going uh, and it's very hands-on, very kind of labor and, and knowledge intensive in those early phases. Uh, if on the ORI platform you can is, has been built so it's flexible enough to be able to do that kind of process, and if you can get it to work on the ORI platform, then it will, it will scale with you into the clinic and ultimately to commercial scale manufacturing, which has really been the, the challenge, is it that translation of that academic process into the clinic is often very difficult and very expensive. But also often can be done because you're serving relatively few patients in a clinical trial setting. Maybe you're treating 30 patients or 100 patients. It's a relatively small number. When you try and translate then that clinical process 
uh, into a commercial scale process where you want to treat thousands of patients or tens of thousands of patients is really where the industry has struggled. Um, and that's where most of the companies uh, thus far in the uh, cell and gene therapy field have have really met some significant challenges and been un and unable to overcome them. That comparability, being able to prove to the regulator that that process you're using to create the commercial scale doses is the same one that you use in your clinical trials, incredibly difficult. With the ORI platform, we allow for seamless comparability across the spectrum. So you go from preclinical into clinical, from clinical to commercial uh, in a seamless way, taking out all of that comparability risk and that risk to getting to scale. Because uh, again, ultimately our, our goal is to get these products to patients uh, in a widespread manner uh, and to make sure that they can benefit from these truly incredible therapies. So that's one approach, you know, through automation, technological advances, being able to bring a new approach to manufacturing. Uh, another approach currently being explored is uh, an allogeneic approach where we take donor cells rather than individual patient cells, creating a personalized therapy. We create, we take donor cells, uh, that we can potentially treat many patients with, and we can do so at larger scale, uh, similar to what you might see, or ultimately the goal would be to, similar to what you might see with a biologic, you know, an antibody-based medication. Uh, so that's another approach. It has its own challenges. Uh, it might help us, you know, have fewer manufacturing runs to create more doses, uh, but there are clinical and scientific challenges uh, with allogeneic. Obviously, taking an, another person's cells and putting them into uh, into me or you our immune system is not going to like that. <laughs> they're they're going to want to fight that off. Uh, and so being able to make those uh, type of, of interventions acceptable to patients uh, still has a way to, a ways to go yet. But those are the two major ways we're trying to, uh, to really tackle these challenges through technical innovation, automation, you know, process development uh, innovation, uh, and through new modalities like, uh, like allogeneic approaches that'll help us increase batch size uh, and on the on the gene side, on the gene therapy side, um, you know, the viral vector manufacturing is incredibly complicated, and it's one of the major stumbling blocks and major cost components uh, for these gene therapies. So they're really trying to build out new approaches uh, to viral vector manufacturing uh, and to think about ways they can do gene therapy using different technologies that are higher throughput and higher quality uh, and ultimately lower cost. So similar approaches across the spectrum uh, in, in trying to open up access. And do you, do you think that um, in the light of how quickly the, the COVID vaccine was kind of developed and then approved for use, do you think that, that that will benefit the industry as we move forwards to help with some of the hurdles, the regulatory processes? I do. I do think it is. I mean, I think, you know, the, the world's response and the regulatory response and the kind of industry's response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been incredible. I mean, you think about the, you know, three or four vaccines that have been developed in record time and be able to be rolled out. So I think really what's networks required and what's the kind of key learning from that is you think about where there's a will, there's a way. When the, when everyone's sort of incentives align and the regulatory uh, bodies are open to innovation and the governments and payers and everything aligns, things can happen very quickly. Uh, and I don't want us to lose the lesson there. You know, I think the you know, I was sitting on a panel not long ago talking about this issue and to say, you know, one of the things that we can do is to, if we assure innovators that there's a market for their innovation, they will get paid for their innovation, they'll bring innovation to market. It's as simple as that. It's the, it's the capitalism works in that way. Uh, and that was what, you know, I think, you know, the, the ability to bring these products to market to help patients and understand that they were going to be able to re recoup their investment. I mean, you know, Pfizer and uh, AstraZeneca and J&J and, &J and some of these companies, Moderna, made huge investments in infrastructure and in manufacturing, in R&D, uh, putting billions of dollars at risk, um, you know, hoping that, knowing that they wanted to help patients, but hoping that they'd be able to return an investment to their shareholders, uh, which is what, you know, companies are required to do. So I think the alignment of uh, incentives around markets being, you know, making it clear that payers are going to pay for innovation. Uh, is one key hurdle to overcome or one key learning uh, from COVID-19. Another, as you mentioned, was the regulatory constraints. You know, I think we allowed for compassionate use. We allowed a, a fast path to market because uh, the cost of not doing that was higher than the cost of doing it. You know, we thought we needed to get these products out to people and, to, you know, they were whose lives were at risk from COVID-19. When you're thinking about, um, 
you know, cancer and the number of people that are infected by cancer every year um, and the type of patients that we're treating with cell and gene therapy. These are often patients with no other option. You know, they're they are on, on the last stage oftentimes. So what is the real risk, you know, to giving people access to these products more quickly uh, than we are today? I'm not sure that there is significant patient risk uh, to doing that. So I think we need to continue with our market innovation, continue with regulatory innovation, uh, and continue with, you know, sort of manufacturing innovation and, and you know, distribution. You've seen supp global supply chains put under a lot of stress uh, through the pandemic, uh, not only for, for uh, life sciences products, but for things like semiconductors and, you know, just wood and, and paper and, and other kind of raw materials, uh, PPE. Uh, so, you know, we need to be, look very closely at how we're managing supply chains to make sure that we have the capability to deliver uh, these products to patient, the patients who need them. Uh, so we're, we're thinking about at Ori, you know, how do we do manufacturing, you know, close to where the customers are, close to where the patients are. We need to have a business continuity plan that includes, you know, at least at the very minimum, Western Europe and North America, um, and making sure that we can serve patients without having, you know, these products go out of stock. If you're running a clinical trial, if you're a therapy developer and you go out of stock, I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a, a critical ingredient potentially, like, you know, uh, your viral vector. What if you went out of stock just for a bag, a bag you needed to do a step in the process that it's not there anymore? Uh, you can't run your process. You can't run your clinical trial. You can't treat patients. If you're commercial, you can't run your commercial process. So it's very, very important that we look at su supply chain security as well uh, as another lesson from the pandemic. Brilliant. Well, thank you. So I guess finally, do you want to just tell me a bit about what's next for Ori Biotech in the next one, two, three years? Sure. It's a super exciting time for the company. Um, we are, um, last year we closed our Series A financing round, which was a, a 23 million sterling round. Um, we were about six people full time at that point. Uh, we're 31 as of today. Uh, so we're growing fast. Uh, really trying to bring in the leaders from cell and gene therapy. We've got an incredible team uh, and we're finding a lot of great talent, both in the UK and in the US. We've got, now got four or five people in the US starting to build up our customer facing team there. Uh, but we're continuing to do our research and development engineering work in the UK um, and looking for great talent. So anyone who's watching this and interested in, in cell and gene therapy with you know technical engineering skill or scientific skills, we're very excited to talk to you. And also, interestingly, data science. You know, data science is one area that is in hot demand everywhere in the world. Uh, but the ability to combine kind of life sciences, biological training with data science is, is an extremely difficult uh, set of skills to find. Uh, so, if there are any you know college students out there, you know, thinking about what course they should study, uh, going into data science and, and studying biology is a is a skill set that's in great need out there. So we're looking to hire the best best talent uh, in globally, uh, but particularly in the UK that's operating in this field. Uh, and as we do that, we're de-risking the technology. Uh, we're going to be uh, moving into a commercial launch phase next year. So the hope is that our platform will be the first generation of the platform will be available to therapy developers and in the clinic treating patients in clinical trials uh, by the end of next year. Uh, so very exciting times to see what's been, you know, five or six years of hard work trying to create the platform and bring it to life and test it, make sure it's safe, make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Uh, and to actually see it treating patients will be a huge milestone for the business uh, and for all of us, you know, who, who really are really super passionate about achieving our mission and making sure that patients get treated with these incredible therapies. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to hear about what's going on at Ori Biotech and your passion for the biotechnology um, sector in the UK. So thank you for thank you for joining again and I look forward to catching up with you soon. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks.